Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 99, Revelation, the last shall be first. And the following is a sermon that I preached um, several weeks ago, actually, uh, September 27th of this year on the passage in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, which is Jesus's parable of the workers in the vineyard. This is actually a text that I preached on three years ago. Being an Anglican priest, we preached through a lectionary. And I took that sermon that I preached three years ago, and I actually published it on this podcast as episode number 20, Do You Begrudge My Generosity? And I released that episode January 31st of 2019. If you'd like to go way back in the archives of this podcast and find that episode, it will be somewhat similar to this one. Now, this is the first time I've done anything like this on the podcast. Um, I'm actually repeating something, although it's different. It's three years removed, and I'm inviting you in to how over a three-year period of time, I approached the same passage, but with a constantly developing awareness of what all I think is actually going on there. And so it, it probably goes without saying, although I'll say it anyway, that my approach to Matthew 20, 1 to 16 this time around had all that I saw in it last time as a foundation. And for this particular sermon, I chose not to repeat much of what I said three years ago. Instead, I just tucked all that as a way, um, as background, and then I built on it. And again, this is a huge advantage, I think, really, of preaching through texts in a lectionary. It allows me to approach a passage three years further in my walk with Jesus with three years more life experience, allowing the truths I saw in a particular passage three years ago to solidify in my mind and heart and to take root in how I read other passages in the Bible, how I live my life, what's going on currently in a society, how I think the members of my church are responding well to those situations or into situations in their own lives and on and on and on. Now, for you as listeners to this podcast, I would actually encourage you to go back to episode number 20 and to listen to that sermon before you listen to this one. Now, I'm not sure you'll do that. Uh, Maybe you'll do it in reverse. Some of you like to get connected and don't want to fiddle with your phone, and I get it. But if you go back and listen, it will make your listening experience and my take on the passage this time around, it'll make it much richer and a whole lot more complete. And I just wanted to share that with you, not because I want to get more listens on a previous episode, but because this is sort of an experiment. Again, I said I've never done anything like this before. But the reason why I've chosen to insert this sermon here on the podcast um, is because this particular parable of Jesus is helps explain the kinds of things that are being judged in the book of Revelation. And there will always be systems and structures policies and ideologies at work in this world and in nations, and sadly, even in churches, where the first are exalted as first, and the last, well, the last are just that, last, out of sight, out of mind, but they are not out of God's sight and God's mind. And the deceptive ways of the enemy is at work and such that he subtly convinces us that being first is really where we all ought to aim, that we all ought to see the truly corrupt people as those outside of our people group or way of life. But as I'll point out in this sermon, even Christians fall prey to the belief that the first shall be first and the last last. But that is the antithesis of the way of Jesus. Might we even say that it is anti-Christ? And yet its corrupting spirit knows no bounds, and it will deceive even well-intentioned Christians if we are not constantly on guard against it. And I do believe that that is one of the main thrusts in the book of Revelation. It is not to comfortably rest in a position where because we believe the right things, we have nothing to concern ourselves with, but that it's those really bad people who vote the wrong way, who believe the wrong things about the world that are going to get their judgment one day. John is at pains to recognize that the same deceptions that are going on at the world at large can very easily suck Christians in. 
And so John's presentation of these deceptions, John's presentation of these judgments, John's presentation of the posture that the Lord has toward oppression and toward waywardness and toward injustice is such that if the Christians find themselves in any way, shape, or form caught up in that, they need to repent because those things are going to be judged and they don't want to get caught in that. And so that's really the thrust of why I'm inserting the sermon here. And I want us to connect with it again on a different level. Again, this is an experiment for me. This is fun. I would love to hear your feedback at the end of this because I am sort of throwing it out there. Um, Here's the way I thought a passage should be interpreted three years ago. Here's how I'm preaching it a little bit differently this time, although it's not totally different. And I think if you're familiar at all with episode 20, Do You Begrudge My Generosity, you will see some of the connections that I'm trying to make in the way that I preach it this time around. So without any more of an introduction, I offer to you the sermon, The Last Shall Be First. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these, wor- these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Jesus, we ask you to speak to us this morning as your people, and elevate yourself as the rightful king. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I would like to look first at the last thing that Jesus says in his statement. And so if you have a Bible with you and want to open it to Matthew chapter 20, which was the passage I just read, and drop your eyes down to verse 16, I'd like to focus our attention on the statement that Jesus ends his parable with. So the last will be first, and the first last. Now, What should we make of a statement like this? The last shall be first and the first last. An interpretation I've often heard is one that goes something like this. It compares the 11-hour workday to the period of someone's lifetime. The conclusion then would be that Jesus being merciful with a man who works only one hour would be like him forgiving a man of his sins on his deathbed, the 11th hour, And other followers of Jesus getting upset that they spent their entire lives following Jesus, but in the end, both men are equally rewarded heaven. Now, that particular interpretation is understandable to me. Other parables of Jesus describe life at the end, and so it's common to imagine Jesus is simply doing the same thing here. But if we back up and look at the first thing Jesus says in reference to this parable... we will get a clue that something else is going on. A heart attitude that will need to be addressed in everyone who hopes to find a home 
in the kingdom of God. Our passage this morning is yet another example of a time where chapter breaks in our Bibles can sometimes get in the way of our understanding. In case you are unaware, chapter and verse markers are not original to the biblical writings. So Matthew did not pencil in numbers to designate where these breaks should appear. These chapter and verse breaks were added later once Bibles were in print to make locating a passage of the Bible easier. Now, personally, I'm thankful for chapter and verse designations. How else could we all turn to the same passage in our different Bibles? I'd have to walk around with you. I would have to open your Bible to the various places, and I would have to point to you to where I'm trying to explain. Instead, all I have to do is say, Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, you know where we are. But chapter markers in particular often give us the impression that a biblical writer is now starting a new thought, similarly to how chapter breaks function in a favorite novel of ours. But that assumption would prove very unhelpful. Because in the final verse of chapter 19, the verse that, in the flow of Matthew's thought, immediately precedes Jesus' parable, Jesus says this, But many who are first will be last, and the last first. It's a nearly identical statement to the final verse of our passage in Matthew chapter 20, only the the order of the words first and last are just reversed. Now, if the verse right before our passage and the last verse of our passage say the same thing, then it's reasonable to conclude that what appears between these two verses might offer us an explanation as to what the phrase means. And if we look at the context of chapter 19 that ended with these words, it might help us understand why Jesus tells this parable and then ends it with the same words. Somehow chapters 19 and 20 are connected And they're connected with the phrase, the last will be first and the first last. Something prompted Jesus to use this phrase the first time and then to tell us a parable to illustrate it. And so if we can keep the two sections together in our minds, one might help us interpret the other. So let's begin by looking at chapter 19. The immediate context is of a rich young man asking Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus tells him to keep the commandments, and he rattles off several of them. The man assures Jesus that he's done just that, and then he asks Jesus at the end of verse 20, what do I still lack? Verse 21, Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the man's question, what do I still lack, is an intriguing one. Those who are rich tend to see their lives in terms of lack, or better yet, what they don't lack. This man approaches Jesus the same way he approaches every other area of his life, checking his resources against what he hopes to obtain by them. In the dialogue he initially has with Jesus, his money doesn't even come up. What does come up, though, is his moral wealth, all the assets he's acquired that he believes ought to grant him entrance into the kingdom. The trouble that Jesus recognizes right away, though, is how dependent this man is on what he has, and on what he's done. In Jesus' eyes, he lacks the recognition that he is other than his resources. He lacks the ability to see that his riches, whether his moral excellence, material possessions, or the idea that he can obtain whatever he wants in life because of his wealth, are of no value to him as a citizen of God's kingdom. But this man also lacks the vision to see what life might be like apart from his wealth. He lacks the ability to imagine a world, a kingdom, where his wealth wouldn't be important, but instead where God's wealth would be all that mattered. So Jesus invites him to. He invites him not only to imagine that kind of a world, but to experience it for himself. 
Go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure, treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus invites the rich man to follow him and experience a life of God's riches and provision instead of his own. Yet sadly, we read in verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now, this is hard for you and me to process, but the man just leaves. He just walks away from Jesus. And here's the strangest part. Jesus lets him walk away. He doesn't offer this man the plan of salvation. Jesus doesn't say, just believe in me and you'll have eternal life. He doesn't plead with the man and he doesn't threaten the man with judgment for leaving. He simply lets him choose his wealth over the kingdom. And then he turns to his disciples and says, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is it difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven? It's difficult because a kingdom where God meets all of your needs isn't good news to a person who already meets all of their own needs. In the rich man's eyes, he has too much to lose to enter the kingdom. Those who are rich grow accustomed to relying on their riches, whether moral, financial, material, whatever, to secure for themselves all that they want and need. The trouble is that in God's kingdom, one's own riches are of no value. In the kingdom of God, riches aren't defined by what we have. They're defined by what God has. Now, this is good news to those with nothing, but it's not received in quite the same way by those who have much. It's great news that those who are last get to be first, but that same announcement of the kingdom is not so great for those who've grown accustomed to always being first. You see, in the minds of the wealthy, they are rich and they are first because they've earned it. They've worked hard for what they have and they've worked harder than others. And as a result, they've grown to expect that they will have something to show for it. Increased wealth or respectability or privilege of some kind. And what ends up happening is that they begin comparing credentials sizing others up and assigning value both to themselves and to others based on what resources they each have. As they compare resumes, they grow increasingly comfortable seeing themselves as first and find it increasingly difficult to imagine a world where things would be any different. Money, though, isn't the only area in which people are tempted to see themselves as first. One might also see himself as first and others as last based on things like appearance, Education, eloquence in speech, Bible knowledge, wealth, race, success, talent, godliness, gender, age, experience, believing the correct political viewpoint, being well-liked by other people, having your life together, having well-behaved kids, not struggling with depression or emotional issues, having everything in your life work out perfectly well because you were the one responsible for it, and on and on and on. This ordering of ourselves game, this comparing of credentials and then categorizing some as first and others as last is normal within the kingdoms of the world, but it has no place in God's kingdom. And so in order to explain why it is difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus tells a parable. He sets up a scenario where one's hard work and what one has earned do not grant them increased wealth or respectability or privilege over anyone else. Jesus offers an explanation of what life in the kingdom of heaven is actually like. And it is a brilliant explanation. Laborers are hired by the master of a vineyard for a denarius a day. Throughout the day, various additional laborers are hired by the same master, agreeing to work on nothing but the master's promise, <clears throat> whatever is right, I will give you. And then we read this 
starting in chapter 20, verse 8. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Now it's important to remember that Jesus is explaining what the kingdom of heaven is like. What is causing all the upheaval is that the master of the vineyard is not treating the rich the way they have grown accustomed to being treated. The problem that surfaces is that the first have been first for so long that they cannot comprehend being anything other than first unless some injustice has occurred. And right here, the man who worked 11 hours actually accuses Jesus himself of being unjust. To which Jesus replies in classic Jesus fashion, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? The wrong that this worker is accusing the master of isn't even about what he was paid. He agreed to work for a denarius and he received a denarius. The wrong being committed is that the master made someone else equal with him that he felt didn't deserve to be. And he instantly starts grumbling to the master about it. A friend pointed out to me this week that the order in which Jesus pays his workers is a significant point in the parable. Jesus pays those who worked last first so that those who worked first would see what those who worked last received. If he had done it the other way, those who worked first might have taken what they'd worked for and left. But Jesus wants everyone to know how he treats all his laborers. There are no secrets in the kingdom of God. Everything is out in the open. And it's this very reality out in the open that is the cause for all the trouble. Those who worked the longest do not like this arrangement. They do not like it at all. Now, there are two things, I think, at least, that we need to see from this man's interaction with Jesus at the end of the parable. The first is that in the kingdom of God, the master gives special care to those who have been overlooked, not hired, who have, for whatever reason, been relegated in this world to the last place. He does not dismiss those who are first, mind you. He provides for them as well. He simply provides for the first and the last in the same way. Now what this means is that you don't have to be on equal footing with others to receive equal treatment from the master. The master of God's kingdom does not show partiality. He does not favor the rich over the poor those who've worked more over those who've worked less, those whose abilities exceed the abilities of someone else. Jesus is not looking for you to have your life altogether, for you to come overcome the sort of weaknesses that the great people of our world claim to have overcome. He's not looking for you to be the best parent or the perfect friend or the greatest spouse before you can come to him. In other words, Jesus welcomes you into his kingdom not because of who you are, or what you've done, but because of who he is and what he's done. And if you've ever felt for any reason that you are less than another person, 
less intellectually, less financially, less spiritually, less morally. Knowing that Jesus doesn't play the comparison game we so often get caught up in is incredibly good news. But how do you imagine such news is received by those who feel that they are more than others? By those who don't fall short. By those who always seem to do things right. Who know themselves to be first and expect that others will too. This is the reality Jesus is faced with as he comes proclaiming his kingdom. Different mindsets in different people who hear the good news. This is why it is difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom. And this is the second thing that I want to point out about Jesus' interaction with this disgruntled worker. Jesus' parable is a crystal clear illustration of why the values that the rich live by <clears throat> are incompatible with life in the kingdom of God. And I need you to listen to me closely here. The values of the rich are not incompatible with the kingdom because Jesus doesn't like the rich. They are incompatible because the rich do not like Jesus' understanding of justice. The difficulty does not lie with Jesus. It lies with the values of the rich person. And so Jesus is not preventing the rich from entering the kingdom. He's explaining what prevents the rich from wanting to enter or even liking Jesus' kingdom way of life. They may not like it because those who are first tend to believe that they bring more to the table than those who are last. And because they bring more to the table, they believe they should be first in line to eat from it. Now, that very thing happened in the church in Corinth, believe it or not. The wealthier believers were arriving to the Lord's Supper, which was an entire meal in those days, not simply the wafer and sip of wine that we participate in today. But these wealthier believers were eating all of the food and drinking all of the wine before the poorer working class believers arrived. They were helping themselves first at the very meal intended to embody the reality that everyone is welcome to the table equally. Now, if you're tracking with that idea, this is the height of hypocrisy. Promoting themselves as celebrating the Lord's Supper in the exact opposite thing that the Lord's Supper is intended to communicate. And Paul flat out rebukes them for it. Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Now that's a sharp rebuke. It's a well-deserved one, but it's a sharp rebuke. Anyone want to guess what Paul's very next words are to the church in Corinth? For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Sound familiar? In context, the verses we read every Sunday are a corrective to the corrupt practices of the Corinthian church where actual Christians were denying Jesus' words that the first will be last and the last first. This was happening in a church. In their so-called Lord's Supper, they are celebrating that the first are the first and that the last are last. Praise Jesus. We get to be first. But in Paul's mind, Eating a meal in remembrance of Jesus necessitates treating all those at the meal with the same compassion and care that Jesus demonstrated and offering himself up for them. To continue right on eating and drinking in the same self-serving ways the rich had grown accustomed to was to deny the very kingdom reality <laughs> this meal was intended to symbolize. 
And if the Corinthian Christians could comfortably settle right back into their deeply ingrained ordering of themselves that Jesus so directly challenged, what's to say we never could? To be honest with you, it's easy to do, particularly as Americans, who tend to see themselves as first in just about everything. It's understandable that we do this, of course, since all of us in this room anyway are Americans. But we have to understand how this works against the ways of the kingdom. And therefore, it's important that we work overtime to remind ourselves that by his blood, Jesus has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and has made them all a kingdom and priests to our God. And in order to do this, the master has given special care to those who've been overlooked, who have, for whatever reason, been relegated in this world to the last place. And he's chosen to include all of us, not because we are first or better or more responsible or because we bring more to the table, but because he is gracious and has freely welcomed us. And because he has, we as his people worship him and honor him as our king When we work to create a community that becomes an extension of the same kind of grace he exhibited, where our concerns become for those who are last or least or overlooked or oppressed, where we learn to set aside our own privileges so that others feel welcomed and cared for, where we recognize areas where we've been privileged and learn to listen to the concerns of those who've been disadvantaged. This is who the church is meant to become. A community committed to Jesus who enters into what we might call counterintuitive solidarity with the oppressed. A community who learns to become attentive to all the diverse experiences in our society and the people who share those experiences and a community committed to keeping track of any time anyone is deemed as less valuable than another person. Such attention and care for the last is how Jesus defines life in his kingdom. And faithful citizens of that kingdom ought to define their lives in the same way. And so when we pray to our Father that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, This is what we are praying for. We are praying for his powerful presence working in and through us to reorient our hearts such that we want this kind of kingdom here, now, today, and that we are committed to setting aside our place as first in order to help make that happen. There is no greater way to express our love for our Father than to love what he loves and to be on constant guard against the ways in which we order ourselves as societies, as cultures, as those who hold certain belief systems, whatever there is in life where people are drawn to order themselves in such a way that they see themselves and their way of thinking and their way of being as first and not last. And it's not an unwelcomed rebuke any faithfully growing Christian open to the work of the Holy Spirit will always continually see more and more areas of their lives where they have comfortably found themselves in the first position and will need to have their eyes opened to those who have not. So it's not an unwarranted rebuke. It's not a hateful remark when Jesus critiques this. If we are open to hearing his words, that all are welcome to the table and all are welcome there on equal footing. It's hope-filled. But when I read a parable like this, I can't not see myself as those in the first position because quite frankly, that's where we are. We've got lots of things. We've got lots of position. We have lots of privilege. What would that look like as a faithful Christian to begin expanding our view for those who are last and least 
and overlooked so as to begin to mirror in our life as a community the same kind of life Jesus embodied as our Savior. Let's pray. (coughs) Jesus, we want to hear the words, the last will be first and the first last as good news. And so if there are ways in our lives where we've been first, show us how exciting and life-giving it can be to let go of some of those things in order to make room for the last and the least. I don't know what that means for each person in this room, but I know that there are specific things that your spirit wants to do in each of us, even as we think about a church merger as a community, but also as society, as our culture is very much in need of a body of people who can listen and who can learn from one another and who don't get so quickly offended and turn things um, violently as a result. Jesus, you know where you want to take us. You know what you want to do with us. And we thank you that you're committed. You began the good work in us. We'll faithfully complete it. (coughs) And so we entrust ourselves to you to do whatever you want to do with us. Lead us after you, we pray. In your name, amen.